Welcome to Critical Aspects of Law Enforcement, a podcast where we dive into the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being of the law enforcement officer. Welcome back to Critical Aspects of Law Enforcement. I'm your host, Vernon Phillips, and today we've got a special guest for you. And it's kind of funny because we say, welcome back to Critical Aspects of Law Enforcement, but our guest today... um, They work closely with law enforcement, but he's not in law enforcement. But uh, today we've got Josh Mader on here, and I'm just going to turn it over to him real quick and let him explain uh, who he is, what he does, and just a little bit about himself, his background. And then we're going to jump into some conversations, and hopefully this won't be a train wreck and crash and burn. But we'll see. (laughs) Probably. Who knows? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, yeah, so um, my name is Josh Mader. I've been with uh, Marion County Fire Rescue since 2006. Um, I started as a firefighter EMT right out of high school, um, then went and got my medic after a year or so, and then was on an ambulance for a while, and then got my driver. I drove for a long time as a driver engineer. I got, went on the hazmat team, so I'm a hazmat tech. So I did all that stuff with our special ops guys. Um, then I decided to step away and run my business. And then I immediately came right back as kind of like a pseudo chaplain kind of thing, just because I've always been, you know, the guy that everybody, you know, liked and you know, I was just known as a good Christian kid. So that's kind of been in, that's what, 10 years ago now. So been, that's 18 years total in the service. So you've spent 18 years in the in the fire service? That's correct. Yeah, eighteen years total between on the line, and then as a as a chaplain type deal. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, obviously, being you know being in fire rescue, being a fireman, then also being a chaplain for now fire rescue, um, you know that takes that takes a toll on the individual person. You know, it takes a toll on right. you. So how do you maintain just your overall physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well being? Um, in that regard to, you know, just where you're at right now? Uh, well, you know, it's, I think one of the most important things is, is having a good home church. Um, you know, I grew up in the church um, and, you know, having that, that good, you know, group of people that you can go to, you know, cause where's the chaplain go when the chaplain struggles, you know, finding a good church home and, and good guides that you can talk to, to kind of help you get through, <clears throat> sorry, a lot of the stuff that, you know, that we go through as chaplains, but um, <laughs> I'm not as physical <laughs> as I used to be. Um, it's just, I have three little baby, three, three little kids and, you know, I have probably no excuse, but I got the old dad bod thing going on, you know? Um, Some people but, like the dad bod. Apparently. I, I, I mean, guess that's the, I, I, mean, I personally, you know. I personally don't like your dad bod. I mean, but well, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, I would say the same. Yeah. For you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're making you, me sick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's okay. I'm completely comfortable with that with with that's, that that transaction there. So that's good. That's good. <laughs> so yeah, I mean so that that makes that keeps you busy. I mean, you know, having kids, you know, running a business, you know, doing your ministry, um, that keeps you busy. So I understand that. I mean, but you know, actually being plugged into a church home, making sure that you are getting that aspect taken care of. I mean, that is a huge important uh, factor. And you know, we we often talk about this on the show is that. I don't know how individuals in the first responder profession, you know, who don't have faith actually really deal Mm. well with the stuff that they see and, and come in contact with. Um, But we know historically that they deal with it it, with negative coping strategies and they don't deal with it in the healthiest way, or they just really focus in on one specific area. You know, like they're, they get really heavy into the physical aspect of it, right? Absolutely. Uh, trying yep. to exert a lot of those emotions with physical exercise, which is a, that is a good technique, right? That is a good coping mechanism, but that's not the only coping mechanism. Um, so I'm glad that, you know, you, you share that plug in there about having that, that community, that church home. Um, Cause that's a, that's, that's outside of the profession. Mm-hmm. And that's something we want to encourage, right? Is for, first responders to get plugged in somewhere outside of the profession with other people who don't think the same as you. Um, that, uh, you know, you're not going to get together and talk shop, even though sometimes that can be therapeutic, but then 
often that generally turns into a bashing a bashing sesh of um you know supervisors the job current right you know right. policies and procedures and all that but so why is it important for you to make sure you're plugging into uh that community aspect the church aspect well like i kind of like i said before you know it's it's good to have other people that like you said are not 100 they're not in this world in this realm that can kind of take a 30,000 foot view of of your situation you know as a specific call or a specific issue you're having with somebody at work um, and just kind of bounce ideas off of other people, you know, just seeking, you know, godly wisdom, you know, about this situations and issues and, and whatnot. Um, yeah. I just, I find it having a good church, a good biblical Bible based church, you know, not just a big, you know, mega church that there's 20,000 people. Well, that anyway, that's just my opinion, but you know, having a good Bible based church that is, they use the Bible to, to teach out of, you know, what a crazy concept kind of yeah. thing um these days you know what yeah. a crazy concept um but just a good bible based church just yeah that's that's basically what i think you need you know and it's a lot yeah. of these firemen and stuff that aren't that don't grow up in the church don't have a church you know it, it's tough you know and that's what i'm trying to figure out with a lot of these guys is you know what do you do you know how how, how can i help you do something but you know what do you do typically to to help yourself kind of thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. So when you look back, you know, over the time you've spent in, you know, just the, the fire rescue service and that, you know, that area, what is, if you want to share, like, you know, what is one of the most, you know, significant calls that you remember? And then how did you get on the other side of that? <laughs> you know, I, I figured these questions, people ask these questions all the time, you know, what's the worst call you've ever seen, you know? And, um, it, and I, it, and before you, I want to, I want to kind of just touch on that because um, I've had people say to me before, like other people who do, you know, podcasts are like, like, why do you ask that question? You know, we hate being asked that question. I said, I know. Oh, I don't hate I it. Said, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but I said, I know that most of the time, like you hate that question because you're like, oh, you know, they, the people just want to hear these crazy stories. But, <laughs> but, you know, for me, it, it's very strategic in the fact that if we can talk about it, right, and we can draw that out. And we get other people willing to say, "Hey, yeah, this was the worst call. This is how it, you know, it impacted me. This is what I did, or this is what I'm, mm -hmm. this is what I'm doing." Then it sparks that conversation, and it gets others in the first responder community to be more willing to talk about a significant call that maybe they're dealing with that historically we don't generally talk about. Right? We we push it down. Sure. We we uh, we try to ignore it. We try to act like it's not there. So. Um, but, but yeah, just, it's kind of funny. Cause you're like, oh, it's definitely a regular like community question that I get. Like, <laughs> hey, yeah. so what's, what's, what's the crazy, what's the, what's the worst call you've ever been on, you know? And, uh, but what, yeah, so, hey, hey, well, I tell right? you, yeah, like my, the, the first one that always comes to mind when everybody asks that is the first day it was July or January 1st, 2013 or something, 2012, 2013, I was on it, I was driving engine 16, which is in Shady, uh, and we got a call for a, somebody that, you know, allegedly got hit by a train, quote unquote, kind of deal. I'm not going to say where it was, because anyway, um, yeah. so we go there, we go to the top of the hill, and they're like, yeah, there's nobody, you know, and we see a guy walking down the tracks, we're like, okay, that's just, you know, and the guy starts pointing, we're like, so we look down, and sure enough, there's a person on the railroad tracks and the train had just come over da, 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 all the way over him. Person was alive. A and O times three knew what happened. It was probably a 60 foot drop. Um, the bad part is it was, it was a kid. It was a young, mm. it was a young teenager. Um, you know, I didn't have any kids at the time. Uh, but you know, that was just, you instantly go into work mode. You're like, Oh my goodness, this is a, I don't want to have to say the age but, whatever. Yeah. It was like, it was a teenager. Uh, yeah. and then I just remember working on the kid and looking up and his, and his mother was screaming from the top of the, uh, of the, uh, the bridge, just that death screen, you know, that death screen that, yeah. Anyway. So it's just one of those things where, you know, that is always stuck in my mind. Every time I go over this, this specific area, you know, I, 
kind of instantly think of it. I, I don't dwell on it or anything like that, but I, I always think of it. Um, and all these, you know, that was when I was on the line, but as a chaplain, you know, I go to all the bad stuff. That's what we do. If somebody's either, somebody passes away in a car accident or in a fire or just a structure fire or whatever the case may be, typically that's what we go to. So there was a time in the beginning of when I was kind of, kind of getting my feet wet with the chaplaincy, I had three or four signal sevens, um, uh, on the same stretch of road in my old zone, like three days in a row, there were all people hit by vehicle and the same thing. And I was just like, I haven't seen this much death in my 10 years on the line. All of a sudden in three days, I've seen, you know, three people dead on 441, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And, um, that was kind of those things like, okay, I got to take a step back. You know, I got to learn that I don't have to see the bodies if I don't need to, or you know what I mean? Like, that's not my job anymore, you know, as a, as a fireman and as, you know, it's just like that gore thing. You want to see it. Um, but at some point you're like, you know what, if I don't need to see a body anymore, I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to help the crews cut the people out of the car. I, there, there's no benefit to me whatsoever or them. You know, that's just something that took me a while to learn, you know, but that's kind of where, you know, I, that's what I, you know, that's just kind of been my thing is if I don't need to see the body, I don't see him. It doesn't mean anything. I don't need to see yeah. it anymore. Yeah. Sometimes you have to, which is unfortunately what a lot of the, you know, SO has to do. We have to do, you know, it's a part of the job and I get that, but you know, sometimes there's no reason to give yourself any sort of extra you know, traumatic, yeah. you don't have to kind of deal. So what do you do personally to, to kind of decompress from that? Well, a lot of times, you know, what, what I do is I, you know, I talk to, you know, talk to the guys at the, at the scene typically. Um, Cause you know, I know, you know, I know most of the guys being around and um, you know, I, I, I thank God that I'm more resilient than, well, I, I think I'm more resilient than some other folks, you know, just of all the stuff that I've seen and I don't ever really take it home with me kind of thing. But a lot of, for me, it's just talking with the guys, joking around with them, screwing around with them. You know, firemen are, we are very, uh, I don't know what, like we're anyway, but like we're, our, we have really bad humor kind of thing, you know? And, I could say you know, so we, many we things, but I'm going to not, I'm not, I'm going to leave it. I've got to, <laughs> <laughs> right, but it's just that bad humor of, you know, we make fun of something on the side of the interstate with a dead body over here, but that's how we cope with it. We, you know, we make fun of something, but again, it yeah, sounds it's awful. That dark, it's that dark humor. Dark humor. That's yep. what I'm looking for, dark humor. Yep. You know, we have a lot of dark humor, um, but that's what that does is that gets us laughing. And then, you know, once the call's over, you know, in 16, it's not a complete available. We're back, man. It's ready for the next call. You know, you don't take it with you. You leave it right there on the side of the road or at that house or at the hospital or whatever you need to do. You know, that's, you know, talking it out with the guys, I think is, is one of the most important things, at least right then and there, like a quick little hot yeah. wash kind of deal. Yeah. Because it, it takes it, you know, it takes that emotional fuse out of it. Um, Correct. And, uh, you know, so for anybody who's listening, who does understand what a signal seven is, that's a, that's a dead person. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. No, that, no, it's fine. I mean, Look, at, I'm I'm trying to explain it to all three people that listen. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, um, but no, I mean, so th but that's the thing. Like law enforcement's the same way, right? They have that dark humor to where, oh, yeah. um, you know, you you just say really off the wall random things, and it sounds super, um, you know, just like you like you don't care, or you know, if somebody actually heard it, probably be super off offensive, but. It's, it's just kind mm -hmm. of that way of coping in the moment, right? Like the, that's their way of coping in the moment to, to kind of remove that emotional fuse. Now, some people don't have the opportunity to do that, right? And it kind of sets and then from there it kind of festers and later on it, you know, ends up exploding. Um, and that, you know, you deal a lot with that and I deal a lot with that where it's like, you know, now we're kind of dealing with a crisis and um, you probably deal a lot with this yourself, but. You know, somebody comes in crisis, kind of help walk them through it, get them to the other side, crisis averted, and you don't hear from them again for six months or a year until mm -hmm. the next crisis comes around. And um, yeah, right, but 
but yeah, I mean that there's definitely that aspect to the first responder community, that dark humor, um, you know, and we could say all I, kinds I of things. I do have an example from the sheriff's office. I'm sure. I'm sure you do. Um, I got a good one. Do you want to hear it? It's funny. Yeah, as long as it doesn't involve any names or anything. Oh, no, no. I don't know the guy's <laughs> name. No, no it just we had a, somebody was, was dead in the house, uh, but somebody had come to pick up the kids to take them to school. It was their mom. The mom was real sick. Anyway, so we, there was a deputy we used to call Zach Morris. This was years ago. He, just because he looked like Zach Morris from Saved by the Bell, you know, blonde, whatever. So we were just standing outside. That's why I was a brand new medic. And the lady comes up in a car, like, What's, what are you guys doing here? Oh, they're just an issue. So she go wait in the house. So she said, can I go inside and pick the kids up? The, the deputy was like, yeah, sure, go ahead. Come back out. And she was still laying on the couch, dead in the house, right? And he came, and she comes back. She's like, oh, why didn't you say that she was dead in the house? And the deputy looks at her and goes, well, surprise. And we're like, oh, all right, well, let's rescue 16 where assignment complete available, you know? Just that weird, dark humor, like, Someone's like, bro, come on, man. You could have said something uh, a little different than, well, surprise. But like I said, I don't remember his name. But no, just... no, please don't. There's, there's a lot there. I don't want to know any. I don't want to know any names because that, that was that that was years uh, and years ago. Oh, I mean, I was more or less thinking, you know, you respond to, uh, uh, you know, a thirty-four and somebody taking the top of their head off with a shotgun, and you, you know, you look at their hat rack and you're like, hey, you think they're gonna need those? Um, you think they're gonna want that hat? I mean, that's that, that kind of dark that's humor. Exactly, that, that's exactly what it yeah. is. Um, oh yeah, you know, for sure. <laughs> so and most people are like, "You guys out, are, right? you guys are." Oh, no, that's gonna stay in there. We're we're gonna run that <laughs> because if I if if just for some reason that Zach Zach Morris is listening, who I don't even know who it is. That's kind of funny. Um, I mean, first of all, you're 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 a jerk. <laughs> Right. right. Yeah. But, it was, I mean, it's um, funny now, you know, but yeah, it wasn't as funny back then, <laughs> at least not to uh, the lady. I, I'm just thinking so many things like, was it still like an active like crime scene? I mean, uh, think- we had just we had just called her signal seven and walked out of the house and then some random lady showed up to pick the kids up, which the kids were already gone. So I don't know. How, I don't know where she didn't get that message from, but I don't huh. know. It was weird. It was one of those weird things. But that, that is that is you know, weird. Yeah. So to try to, you know, divert the sinking ship, what, um, <laughs> we knew it was going to go this way. Oh yeah. That's why we were going through different names like train wreck. You right. know, uh, uh, sure. Sure. Yeah. What, uh, what is one of the most awkward or funniest calls that you've had to deal with? Uh, well that one was one. So we got that one out of the way. Um, yeah, that, that's definitely then, awkward. Yeah. And then just, Bless her heart. There's, you know, there's a lot of elderly people here in Marion County, and and uh, you know, it's patients get sick or whatever. And this guy was having a real bad stomach, whatever the case was. And we, he's laying in bed. We're like, all right, let's get him tr- transported. And we stood this guy up. This kind of like an, he's an older gentleman, but we stood him up, and he just released all of his bowels. And I laugh. I'd like. It was I shouldn't have laughed, but like it just was like it just kind of struck me funny, you know. So my lieutenant was standing right in front of me, and his wife was standing in the room, and I buried my face in the back of my lieutenant because I was laughing. I couldn't I couldn't stop laughing, you know. And I was like, let me turn and go into the bathroom so I can stop laughing, or so they can't see. But there's a giant mirror, so like, well, I can't go that way. So I literally just buried my face in my lieutenant's back because he's a bigger guy, so nobody could see me, but. That was like, why can't I control myself right now? You know, this guy just, I mean, he's embarrassed, I'm sure. But my gosh, man, that guy unloaded in his pants, buddy. And that's just the kind did of- he have, like, Did he have pants what? on? Did he at least have, did he have pants oh, he had, on? Yeah, he had, yeah, he like, yeah, he did. Yeah, at least that, at least it kind of kept it together. It but like so I said, was, we, could, we could talk for hours on these calls. Yes, he, it was probably, was it like a adult diaper? Um, <laughs> probably. I would imagine, but I tell you, buddy, it was like a cow pie, son. Yeah, uh, and it just it it was yeah. But again, like I said, I that was so many it's so many years ago, but those those are just those awkward calls and those calls that you go on. It's the same people, you know. Every shift, all shifts run on the same person. The old the uh, um, frequent flyers, 
you know, we could talk stories for hours about frequent flyers and y'all have them just like we do. And we're just having like a different aspect. Ours is more the medical side. Y'all are the crazy people, you know, but that, yeah. that's, I mean, it, I hate to say it, but a lot of times that makes it fun. It's weird for us. You know, it's like those, those funny calls are like, I'm laughing so hard that I got to bury my face in the back of my lieutenant. Cause I don't want the wife to see me laughing. You know what I mean? And yeah. It, it's just, those are, those are, are so hard to, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's tough, you know? Yeah. And there's probably a lot of calls where you just like, you just want to be a hundred percent truthful with the individual. And like, why are you oh, wasting yeah. my time and oh, county money gosh. on this nonsense? Like, wait. Oh, buddy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, you... that's been, we've had, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously we know that the first responder profession, it doesn't matter where you work in the first responder field, but we know it's a, it's a demanding job. We know there's a lot of pressure to it. You know, you see a lot of things, you're exposed to a lot of things. Um, do you think we do a good job with our onboarding and our new recruits kind of setting them up, getting them prepared for what they're going to encounter? Um, you know, the yes, old crap in the pants sure. scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I mean, that just comes with, that's just funny. You can't prepare yeah. for somebody going to crap in their pants, you know, <laughs> but like the, like the mental aspect and the, all that kind of stuff. Um, at least again, and I only know Marion County, you know, that's that I don't know other departments and whatnot, but even the same with the city of Ocala, but we, ha Marion County has done such a good job in these last probably decade of, you know, bringing on chaplains, you know, because, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's rare, you know, and our peer support team and our, you know, CISMs teams and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we, uh, we have all these different avenues, all these different tools in the toolbox that you can go to now and they're available for free. Well, yeah, for free with the County. Um, and right when we get our new guys coming in, you know, us as chaplains, we meet with every new hire class coming in, you know, they're very well aware of what we do as chaplains, what the peer support team does you know, what the mental health counselors does or, you know, what they can do. Um, so, I mean, these days it's night and day different from when I started and probably when you started, it was the, you know, I know it's cliche, the suck it up buttercup kind of deal. And that's what it was for years, for years yeah. and years and years, you know, man up, just man up and, you know, just go to the next call, go to the next call. Um, but I think we're doing a great job now as a department. And I think as, at least in the state of Florida, to really start trying to combat a lot of this, um, this craziness that we go to, you know, the calls haven't changed. Yeah. The fires haven't changed. The car wrecks haven't changed, but the people have changed. Us as firemen have changed. The, the younger generation is coming in. They're totally different than our generation, you know, and I'm yep. not that on 37, you know, but I started when I was 19, you know, but it's just, it's a, it's a different, it's just a different realm these days. And I think that we're doing a good job, but, at least giving them options, not just throwing yeah. them out to the wind and say, good luck. Yeah. And I would have to agree, especially, I mean, here, you know, for, for where we're at, um, you know, I think across the board, I think it's getting better, you know, just in the the overall community, but, <clears throat> you know, and, and I'm going to say this and, and I'm never going to say it again. Okay. So write it down, <laughs> you know, screenshot it, whatever you want to do, but got it. You know, <clears throat> yeah, you know, the fire rescue is, you know, for here in our community, um, you know, is is definitely farther ahead than we are. But, um, you know, we're we're heavy. We're, we're heavy on your all's heels. OK, so I, I, I won't I won't tell you. <laughs> oh, I love it. So. So, do, you good. know, don't if anybody says that I that I heard you say that I, I will deny it. Uh, no. I didn't hear uh, anything. I mean, you, you, you guys got a good, you guys got a good program. You guys got a we lot do. of resources put in place. Really do. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that we we're doing, you know, is, is mirrored after what you guys are doing. Um, so it's, uh, it's just different, you know, we're just applying it differently. And, mm -hmm. but I sure, think in you general, yeah, yeah, we are, we are, I think we are doing better, but you know, something that I now am noticing that, and I also know, you know, talking with, um, you know, Chaplain Joe is that 
making sure that we don't lose the spiritual component in just this overall idea of of wellness, right? right? Taking care of ourselves mentally and emotionally. You know, we in the first responder community, there's always been a big push, right? Hey, make sure you're taking care of yourself physically. That was always the thing. Hey, make sure you're you're taking yeah. care of yourself physically, being physically fit. And then through I I would say the the last five years, you've really seen a shift with the emotional and mental. Like, hey, let's make sure oh, we're yeah, taking care sure. of ourselves physically, emotionally, and mentally. But I feel like now that there's been that shift. So like the spiritual component, I think is kind of, you know, it's kind of taking that back seat. It's kind of tracking behind a little bit. So um, that's something that I am wanting to kind of focus more on and, and make sure that we're still offering, you know, viable resources on that, on that front as well. Cause the way I look at it is the four areas that I always talk about is the physical, mentally, emotional, and spiritual, right? Those are the four areas that, that mm-hmm. I feel make up the individual person. Um, we all have a claim, right. we all have a stake in there somewhere. So, and we do, we want to round out all of those. We don't want to just focus in on one or two or none, right? We want to focus on the entire, mm-hmm. the entirety, uh, the entire person. So sure. That, that's why I want to make sure that we're, we're still plugging that in. That's, I know that that's definitely something that you guys are, have, have anted up here in the last, you know, two years for sure. I mean, you know, you went from, from Joe to mm-hmm. how many of there are, you know, five altogether, There's- right? No, there's so a total there's of four. Together. There's one okay, for each four. shift. Yeah, so A, B, and C shift. Yeah, and then Joe is kind of like the head, kind of the head guru guy. You know, we, we he's, say he's he the hates godfather. it, but he's the main shop and we're his, just his assistants, <laughs> you know, which he hates when we say that. But you're right, yeah, he's like, he's the grand poopa or whatever they say that. You know, we're just a little young grasshopper. Yeah, yeah. That's probably not even the right. Yeah. But yeah, no, but you know, we, we do his daily driving around and, you know. But uh, what it ultimately comes down Here's to is like his, uh, his, yeah, his minions. minions. Yeah. <laughs> My kids love minions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for uh, sure. Yeah. Cause he's, uh, he's set such a great tone for all of us, you know? So. Oh yeah. He's, um, he's, yeah. He, uh, yeah. he definitely sets the standard for, and, and he would oh, hate yeah. this if he, heard, if he hears this. He, but he's no, definitely, I think, set the standard for, for chaplaincy, uh, especially in the first 100%. responder community. Yeah. hundred percent. So, yeah. So I think that his new nickname should be Chaplain Joe Godfather. Um, That's fine. Chaplain Godfather. I'm cool with that. Yeah. yeah well, I'll yeah. tell him next time I see him. I think I got a meeting with him. I don't know. Probably this. I don't know who knows. But yeah, I'll let him know. I'll tell him to watch I'll the t- podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he won't. He won't like that at all. Yeah. No, probably but not. no. He. Man, but, on a serious yeah, note, though, he. He uh, he's really done uh, an exceptional job with just um, you know fire rescue oh, support, and then yeah, also what he's doubt. done with the county. So, but mm-hmm. so I mean, as we kind of look at you know shifting from the recruits or people coming on, what about those that you know have fifteen, twenty, twenty five years in? Um, you know, what would what is a piece of advice that you'd give them? Those guys that are kind of already into into the profession already you know, kind of steeped in what we know to right. be the first responder community that a lot of people would refer to as the, you know, the old salty dogs and, uh, you know, the old, hmm. the old crusties and things like that. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, and, you know, and, you know, me being somewhat in that, you know, that kind of time frame too, you know, I know those guys, I know those, those gals that are in those positions and, you know, I, I tell them it's very important, you know, to make sure that the, that the younger guys, you know, know what to do and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I, it's, it's an, it's like a analogy. Somebody told me, I don't remember who told me that, but everybody's got a cup, like a coffee cup. You know, I was just talking to one of my old lieutenants earlier today, you know, it's like a coffee cup and everybody's cup fills up differently. You know, sometimes it takes five calls. Sometimes it takes 50 years, but at some point it's going to overflow or, you know, if you let it overflow. So how do you stop that? How do you stop that overflow? Um, especially, you know, the, the more calls that you run, the more deaths that you see, the more dead babies that you see, that's just more to the cup. That just takes a little bit of life out of you, every single bad call like that. Um, so, you know, so I, I, I just tell them to, you know, just, you know, again, you know, how do you cope? How do you cope in the past? You know, what do you do to, you know, to release stress? And you know, I play with my kids or whatever. It's like, well, go home and do that. 
you know, go home and just relax. You know, don't turn to anything bad, you know, any sort of bad habits, just, you know, like I said, that's, it's a good question. It's hard to, you know, how do you tell somebody with the same amount of years as you, Hey man, you just need to suck it up. And, you know, cause everybody deals with it different, you yeah. know, just being there and listening and, you know, just saying, Hey, just make sure that you're, you know, being a good example for the young guys, you know, cause they're looking to you for everything and they're going to be coming to you before they come to me, you know? So just, you know, know what to say and know how to, to give wise counsel and wise advice. Cause it's coming, it's going to come at yeah. some point. You just, so you got to be ready for it You know, just be ready for those bad calls. And a 19 year old kid who's, you know, just still living with his parents like I was and see a guy with his arms cut off and his torso cut in half. You're like, man, how the heck am I supposed to process this? So you yeah. look to the, to the guys who'd have been around like, I mean, how do you deal with this kind of stuff? You know? Yeah. And you know, that's something that, that I try to encourage. Like, Hey, look, when you I mean to talk about it, right. To, to say, Hey, yeah, absolutely. like to, to do, like do your job, right. There's a time where you need to absolutely cut, suck it up, right. Get through the call, mm -hmm. do what you need to do, handle business. Yep. But then afterwards, when you're all standing around, it's okay to say, Hey, can we all agree that freaking sucked? Like that was, mm -hmm. that was bad. And then when you do that, it gives everybody the opportunity to think, yeah, that was pretty bad, but that doesn't happen. I mean, it probably happens a lot more with you guys, right? Cause you, it does generally, generally it's a larger mm -hmm. group, but you know, on the, on the law enforcement yep. side, it's like, it might just be one or two people, but what happens, mm -hmm. I mean, especially with FTO is you get the new person coming in and you know, they, they respond to a, you know, a 34 and somebody like you know, takes the top of their head off with a shotgun. They're thinking, man, uh -huh. holy smokes, how do I deal with this? And mm -hmm. the FTO doesn't say anything. So they don't say anything. And <laughs> so then they just kind of go on like normal, but, but you know, if we would do a better job of, you know, get back and go like, Hey, how you holding up? That was, that was pretty rough. You know, my first, mm -hmm. you know, 34 that I went to was pretty rough and this is what it was. You know, it's okay to just be like, Hey, mm -hmm. that's, that, that was messed up. And I think the more we do that, right. then the more it gives people the permission to say, Hey, can we just time out real quick and just kind of pull the emotional fuse out of this? Um, Mm -hmm. but that that's often that's great. what we it's a don't great way do. to, to put it right but, i mean but that's not, not what well, we like do it, and, and i got the difference between the it's like the difference between the fire department and like you said in the sheriff's office is you know we're we're a team firemen we're a team we go everywhere together you guys are solo you guys ride everywhere on your own you know so it's a whole lot hard i would imagine a whole lot harder for you guys than it is for us because of that aspect like you know you run a crazy call unless your sergeant's with you or something then you're back on the road by yourself. You know, Wes, we're getting back in a truck with at least four dudes, three or four dudes. And then we're back to the house and we're hanging out at the house, wait for the next call. You guys are going from street corner to street corner. You know, that's tough. Yeah, I don't you, know how you guys yeah. do that. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's tough. Yeah. And I want to, I want to um, show you something here. Um, I got a yeah. little, I got a, I got a little meme that I want to, that I want to show. I, Cause I think this sums up, pretty much everybody in first responder community just in general. Yeah. Um, they just, uh, Oh man, this is, uh, this is what they do. So give me a second here to pull it up. <laughs> all right. So this is, this is what I feel kind of like all first responders do. What are you doing? I'm burying you. I'm alive. I'm alive. No. Let the dirt just shower over you. This is your fault. I'm exhausted. I'm gonna sleep good tonight. That's what happens, buddy. Yeah, so, that's it. So it's funny, funny, right? We we laugh at that, and we laugh at it because we're like, that is so accurate. So I saw that. Oh yeah. Um, somebody from the like the SO actually shared that with me, and I saw that. And I'm like, that is hilarious because it's so accurate, but it's also so funny. Because, you know, it it's just a great illustration because, you know, he's in the he's in the hole and he's like, but I'm alive, I'm alive, right? And that's what we're <laughs> that's what we do, right? Our emotions are very right. much still alive, but we're just gonna cover them up. But hey, twenty years uh -huh. later, they're oh, yeah. definitely gonna come back. Um Oh yeah. Did you notice did you notice who put that out? Yeah, hose draggers. At the, hose draggers, hose draggers, so we were gonna. Yeah, uh, I saw that. Yeah. We were talking about calling this episode 
um, donut lords and hose draggers. Uh, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, We're definitely hose draggers, buddy. Uh, but I mean that that I think that is historically what we've done. So I'm hoping that you know we're doing better at that because that's what we don't want to happen is mm-hmm. um, right. you know, for you to try to bury everything or the the last podcast mm-hmm. I. I had a, a gentleman on, he talked about putting everything in the closet and he said, every once he said, but then that closet door pops open at the worst time. Um, but that's what yeah, it's, happens, it's right? Of, it's like just a different analogy yeah. with the coffee cup. Yeah. yeah. It's of course. And, and that's that the thing. One so call, I mean, yeah. That, that puts you over. So, I mean, that's why you constantly, mm-hmm. whether it's the coffee cup, you need to be, Hey, check in, check in that, that level, right? Where your capacity's at, right. and then if it's starting to get towards the top, hey, okay, I need to empty some of this stuff out. I need to, you know, kind of get rid sure. of some of this, and um, you know, like like that, you know, not burying stuff, not throwing stuff in the closet, and uh, you know, I often use the the beach ball in the pool analogy, where you know, every every single, you know, critical incident or or emotionally charged event, you know, you you take a, a uh, a beach ball, right? And you push it under the water and you get another one, you push mm-hmm. it under the water and like, you're just trying to push all these, not allow them to come to the surface, but eventually you get too many beach balls right. and you can't juggle all of them. You can't hold all of them under. And then mm-hmm. they all come up at once. Yeah. So instead of yeah, doing oh, yeah. one at a time, and then it's, it explodes. Right. Yeah. So, and yeah, you know, you but know, that's what it, happens. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. But that's what happens, right? You, you don't say anything because you don't want people to think that you can't handle the job or that you're weak. So mm-hmm. you're like, Hey, I'm not going to say nothing. I'm just going to stow it. But then eventually something happens or it all comes out at once. And then you, you don't have a choice, right? You have to deal with it. Right. Um, and yeah. so you're like, well, I don't want anybody to think I'm not capable of doing the job, but sometimes you create that cycle because you're not willing to deal oh, yeah. with Mm-hmm. the trauma that you're that you're currently struggling with because you don't want it to impact your job. You don't want them to take your gun. You don't want them right. to, you know, put you at a desk. Right. So you're like, hey, I don't want that to happen. But sometimes mm-hmm. you create the very thing you don't want to happen because you let things go on for so long that you give no choice. So Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's the that's the line, you know, that you almost kind of have to, you know, I think you said it that's perfect. It's like, yeah, you know, I don't want any of my superiors to know that I'm struggling with something. Cause guess what? I'm not going to get that promotion or I'm not going to get, you know, they're going to think I'm weak because I had a problem with a dead baby in a pool. No, that's normal, pal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nobody, that should not be normal for anybody. Yeah. If, you know, it's a yes. total and normal that, reaction for an event like that. Yes. And for the, for the person that that's like, eh, you're like, Hey, um, we got a, yeah, we got a problem here. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's have a conversation. There's yeah. Right. I mean, there's times and a place to joke around about stuff, but there's some things that you're like, okay, that was a little, that was ill-timed kind of thing. Like there's something else going on with you to say something about something that, you know, particular call. You're like, okay, that's not normal to say that right now. It would be in about six months, but when everybody else is quiet and stoic at the hospital and there's a baby in the room, because they drowned, the, you know, the grandmother found it in the pool or something. That's not a time to joke at all, you know? And that that would be like a red flag kind of thing for somebody. If somebody was just like totally nonchalant, oh, this is nothing, this is nothing. You've got a problem, pal. That's not normal. No, you know, and I think to act like Especially that. with you and, in, in, I mean, I think if all first responders, the pediatric calls are, are the worst. They're the worst. Um, the worst, the worst, the worst. The worst. The worst. And e- even if it's, even if you don't have kids, you know, somebody that has kids, it just, there's just mm-hmm. something, it just really, I mean, that's, that's moral injury, right? That transgresses our 100%. deeply held moral beliefs yep. of yep. that's, that's not supposed to happen to a kid, right? Right. That is a hundred percent more injury where you're like, oh, but that's, you know, but that's yeah. part of the job is dealing with those calls Please. and- so what um, yeah, you know, as you as you kind of look at as you kind of look at all the resources you guys currently have, um, what do you think is is the is kind of the the missing piece or that missing connection where hey we've got all these resources but we've got individuals that 
aren't willing to use the resources. What, what do you think is that is that missing piece? That that's a, uh, that's. But it, that's it's the not million dollar question. That, let's say that 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 drawbridge grow down. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's the I, question. I think yeah, that's no, the question that so many of us are facing now. Question. Yeah, it's you know it's it's like that old saying. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You know, with the suicides that we've had here in Marion County, you know, I've known several of them personally, um, and I had no idea, buddy. Not the slightest idea, you know, but it's because they didn't say anything to anybody, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so how do you, you know, it's how do you get somebody to talk if they don't want to talk for one thing and if they're past that point? There's no talking them off, you know, and I hate to say it like that, but, you know, I think the missing link is how do you get them? What's the, what's the magical wand that you wave for people will talk about all their problems? I don't know. That's a great question. Yeah. That's what everybody was asking because... me when the suicides that we had was that like, you know, what, what how, how are we going to fix this? You know what? You tell me, I don't know if they don't want to talk. Yeah. I can't make them talk. Yeah. That's the struggle thing, like, that I think you we have. <clears throat> Yeah, you've got the resources there. I mean, you know, we've got resources now, but it's almost like, you know, the way I kind of look at it is, it, you know, it's it's somebody who who has, you know, insurrection with inside their own castle walls, right? So you've mm -hmm. got your castle, you know, you've got all the protection you have, you've got your moat around, you've got your drawbridge, but the battle is happening with inside your own castle walls, right? Right. And you're standing right. there at the gate, at the drawbridge, and you've got the ability to lower the drawbridge to let the neighboring kingdom come in and help you deal with mm -hmm. the battle that's going on within. Right. Right. But you as the individual, you as the person dealing with all of that, that, that stuff that's internal, all of your trauma, all of your demons, you have to be the one to lower your drawbridge and say, okay, mm -hmm. let me make use of the resources that are right here that are just outside. Right. This right. wall, it's this like you door. Really look for them. No, yeah. it's, it's it's right here. So it's like, how do you get yeah. the person to push that button to to lower that drawbridge yes. to give people? And that's the thing. And I that's think it's it. it, it's getting people to understand. Like, hey, look, there's resources that are here. There's things that are available, but you have to be the one to to open yep. that door. One hundred. Because the battle, the battle is not out here. The battle's in here, right? It and it's in is. here. It always. Yep. It's all right here, buddy. It's always here. It's always personal. It's personal problems that get brought to work. I think personally, that's my kind of opinion on it. You know, Grant, it doesn't yeah, help I, it, that we win bad calls. No, but you know, it's personal stuff. Guys dealing with, like yeah, you said, with your castle. I love that. Cause you don't, you don't separate. So, you know, we have this idea that, that we separate work and home, but we, we don't. Mm -hmm. Work leads into home. Home leads no. into work. They very much intersect. Yep. They intertwine. They 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 run into each other. Um, sometimes, if you do really good at, at managing yourself, um, you know, you can you can keep both areas in check. But oftentimes, mm -hmm. you're bringing work in, or you're bringing home life into work, right? And the problems that you have going on at home are impacting your ability to do your job at work or the things that you're mm -hmm. dealing with at work come home and you're dumping it onto your family. You know, and that's the thing. That's your social support network. That's, that's the, that's your first support group is your family. And those are the right. first people we isolate. Those are the <laughs> first people we isolate. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, whether, you know, whether it's your, your significant other, your spouse, um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, the significant other or the spouse say, I just want them to talk to me. Why won't they talk to me? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's like, I just want to, I, I just want to know what's going on. I want to be able to help. I want to be able to understand. Now, mm -hmm. are they really going to be able to understand? No. Right. No. Do you want to share every single no. detail? No, absolutely no. not. But you can absolutely go mm -hmm. in and say, Hey, it's been a rough shift. I had to deal with some really, really crappy stuff. Um, I'm probably not going to be super engaged tonight, but I just want to let you know that's, it's just, it was a rough day. Um, you know, so, but that gives them the opportunity to say, okay, 
All right. So it's it's been mm-hmm. one of those days. It's been one of those those you know those shifts where they just kind of need a little bit of time to kind of collect their thoughts, get you know, kind of work mm-hmm. through some stuff. So I'm not going to be like, hey, what, what you know, hey, did you take care of this yet? Hey, did you do this yet? Hey, what about this? You you've been gone all day. You've been gone the last you know twelve hours, yeah. twenty four hours. What you know, you haven't done this yet. You said you were going to do this. So then you get the you know the button heads where it's right. like. Yeah, you. The That's first responder tough, saying you don't understand. I you don't understand what I just had to deal with, and then on the other side, the spouse or significant other is like, "Well, you don't ever tell me, so how am I supposed to understand?" Right? Mm. If you would kind of at least let me in a little cycle. bit, I wouldn't hit you yeah. with, "Hey, you said you were going to take out the trash two days ago. The trash is still <laughs> sitting there, right?" But the first responder is still trying yeah. to understand. Hey, how do I get the trash out of here? Like the stuff that's compiled over the last 12, 24 hours, right? right? It's like, yeah. hey, I'm trying to take out the trash in my, you know, the baggage that I've dealt with here. <laughs> right. I don't care about the trash in the kitchen, okay? Um, and then that's <laughs> where we yourself. just run into, yeah, yeah that's where yeah. we run into issues mm-hmm. of communication and marital problems. So that's mm-hmm. the thing is, you know, just kind of, I think the biggest thing is, I don't know, and I don't feel we do a great job educating the family on the profession. Um, I we think we're doing are better on that. On, yeah, so I think we're doing better with the onboarding of our people coming in and our current mm-hmm. people, um, and that's something that that you know I've been trying to work on too. Is like, hey, let's let's create this family dynamic and start incorporating the mm-hmm. family in this, and give them, teach them, hey, these are some of the things they deal with. Um, these are how you can respond to. You know, uh, your deputy, if they've been involved in an officer involved shooting, if they were involved in a, in a you know, in, a, in an accident, if they were shot in the line of duty, if fill in the blank, right? Give them some tools mm-hmm. to then come along and help them support. But they don't have any really inside look other than what they see right. from the first responder of the profession or what they see on TV. Um, mm-hmm. So that's yeah. something I think that we definitely joke. need to, to do better at as, um, you know, as onboarding the family aspect as well so yeah we do i know that counted a couple years we've done like uh family days um we're like we bring you know the the they usually go to church at the springs because they a good facility there they just it's just a family day you know we come in i you know i haven't really been a part of those much uh, but joe lock not as big on that kind of stuff and a lot of our um like uh CISM teams and the, you know, peer support teams and the union and all that kind of stuff there. That's a big thing. I think that we're pushing for is, you know, how do you know, how do we get the families on board to know, you know, these are the type of calls they're going to do. And here's, you know, kind of what to expect from your husband or wife when they show up after a 24 or 48 hour shift and they're exhausted. Here's probably yeah. why and here's the stuff that they got to do. And I think, you know, and I know Joe Lacagnata gives all the new guys a book. I forgot what it's called. Like this is called "I Love My Firefighter." It's a book for the family to read. Like and again, I've never. I'm not a big reader. Um, I do audio books, but I'm not a big reader. Um, but you know, it's a great you, resource to, you know. I did. Do firefighters know how to read? I, I wasn't. I did, I just didn't think no. y'all. I thought that was just no, kind of across the board. No, we, Listen, we know we know enough to pass fire college or to fire college, and we quit, buddy. <laughs> you know, you know, there's probably some of the smartest people that I've ever known are firemen. So it, it's a myth. We're actually some uh, of us yeah. are very, very smart. Well, I mean, you know, just, I'm not just one look of at them, Joe. There, there's a lot just, of smart. Ones. I mean, just look at Joe. That's what I'm saying. Joe. I know, right? I mean, <laughs> just like it's a myth that all cops love donuts. Do you like donuts? Yeah, but I don't eat them. Why? They're good. I love donuts. I don't eat them donuts often are, anymore dude, either. Donuts are great, but um, no, I don't. I don't eat donuts anymore. But I tell you what, my wife does make some really good sourdough cinnamon rolls, and I could probably eat the whole pan. Oh, son, dude. Oh I, yeah. I, oh yeah. I'm a, I'm a I'm a like a carb guy, dude. It's that's tough for me, man. I'm a carb guy. I don't care about the sweets. I'm just a carb guy. Mm, that sounds you, really you like good. a good plate of French fries. Oh yeah, I take listen. Yeah. I take a plate of French fries and a potato chips, and I would a bowl of chocolate any day of the week. Any day of the week. Yeah, I love it. See, I knew I liked love you. It. Yeah, 
I know. Well, it is what it is. A yes. lot of people, you know, I guess that's sort of it. <laughs> hey, so this oh, th this man. is proof that, that, that law enforcement and fire can get along. Oh, yeah. I, I love that so, man. I <laughs> I love it. Uh, I love them. The, no, it's it's good stuff. So as we kind of start wrapping down, um, as you kind of look at where you're at now, I mean, obviously, you know, we kind of already know the answer to this question because, I mean, your shirt does say chaplain. Um, and you did talk about, you know, making sure yeah. that you're plugged into a church. And uh, so how much has your faith uh, played into where you're at now? And where you know currently, um, I think I think it's just been you know I I grew up in the church you know that's all I've that's all I've ever known, um, but you know God doesn't have any grandkids you know God only has children you know so everybody's got to make their own choice um, but I think just you know being as involved as I if I as I've been in the church over the years and um, you know and and I've been on the the worship team I've played drums for since sixth grade type, you know, so drums and guitar and I've always been involved in the church and um, like, you know, just how God has used me over the years to, you know, to help out a lot of people, especially in the fire department. Um, you know, it's just, it's amazing to see how God moves mm. or how, you know, you know, God sees way ahead. You know, we, you know, we want to know up here, but God only shows us right here, you know, but as the years go on, you're like, okay, I see why I didn't do this and I did this, or I decided yeah. to stay at this station and not go at this station. And that brought me to meet this guy who brought me to meet this person. It just, I mean, we could talk for hours just about how the God story of how I came to where I met. Um, but yeah, it just, it's just, I, it's just the faith that I know that God is real <laughs> and God is alive and, and he loves us and he, and he knows what we need. You know, we think we know what we need. We know what we want. But God knows yeah. what we need, you know, and that the hardest part is, is not being able to control that, you know, because at least like a lot of, you know, type A firemen, please, we want to control the situation. That's what we go into this career to do is to control the situation. But, you know, a lot of times in life, you can't control the situation. So mm -hmm. it's hard to it's hard to trust that God does know what he's doing, which we know he does. But not everybody knows that. But, you know, it, it's it's just. I'm just, I'm just glad that God knows what he's doing and I don't have to figure it out myself. Cause I'd have been screwed a long time ago. Oh yeah. You know, I'm a broken man. Like everybody else is probably broken, more broken than people even know, you know, but, um, I'm just thankful for grace and thankful that, <laughs> you know, God sent his son to die for us. And, you know, I, it's, it's such, it's, you know, grace is an amazing thing and I'm so thankful for it, you know? Absolutely. But, so, I mean, obviously, you know, you're, you're a chaplain. Um, so I, I don't know, I don't know if you've got social media, if you're, you know, willing for anybody to, to reach, to reach out to you, but, um, and I don't know how they would, they would, you know, connect with you. Uh, if somebody wanted to reach out and just have a conversation, you know, but if you're, if you're, you know, in, in the fire community, um, you know, and you, you don't have a good chaplain, you know, definitely reach out to some of these guys because they're uh well yeah i mean there's you know you could reach out I, they could get connected with me through fire rescue support uh which is uh joe la canada's non-profit non which you know it's my profile's on there and ways to get a hold of us is on there um but yeah fire rescue support.com i think it's what it's sorry joe i think that's what it's called um but yeah it's um that would trying be, to give joe really the in there and you're not doing a good job yeah like you know i don't <laughs> i don't have any social media i probably should but I haven't been on social media in probably 10 plus years. It's just not my thing. Yeah. Um, no, but, I'll, I'll put that in the show notes. I'll, I'll plug yeah. you know, Joe's yeah, uh, yeah, that website would be great. for yeah. high rescue support. So, yeah. But other than that, I, Josh, cool. I appreciate you coming on. It's a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was good. I, you know, I enjoyed it. So we'll good, have to do me it again. Too. Absolutely. Sounds good. So, all right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you tuning in and listening to critical aspects of law enforcement. Remember to subscribe to the podcast and share this resource with your fellow officers. The goal of critical aspects is to serve, support, and sustain the law enforcement professionals. So head over to www.criticalaspects.org 
For more resources and information, and as always, God bless and be safe.